And um, we, she said, well, what, you know, what do you think? Why do some people say all the power is in the cross and others say it's in the resurrection? And we got talking about how many aspects of the work of Jesus Christ are really not only intertwined but synonymous. When we say the blood or we say the cross, we, we don't even know what all it means, but we mean the same thing, right? It's his obedience and his sacrifice. It's his laying down of his life, and it's his, his picking it up. And it is certainly uh, the ascension, but, but I always like to remind everybody, too, it's the return. Amen? There's power in the return. I've been, uh, I got captivated yesterday with the thought of Jerusalem. Do you know there's something that's been happening for a few years now that believers all over the world... Believers who do not, wouldn't, will not get on an airplane or are not going to travel to Israel, they still want to go to Jerusalem. And I'm convinced that's because the king is about to enter. And there's a sense in the, in the soul of every believer that we have to get there. I, I don't know that we're going to get there physically. That's not what I'm saying. But there's just this, something's happening magnetically or, or spiritually magnetically. Okay, I can't get into all that tonight. <laughs> you, uh, you have a study guide tonight. I didn't make a lot of them, but it's the same as last week. We have been looking at the things that we believe. And when I say we, I mean us at Central, but I also mean us in uh, churches like ours, in our tribe. Uh, last week, Sister Pam and I do a Friday night thing. Most of you know this, but if you don't, Every Friday night, almost without fail, for almost a year now, we've been doing a Friday night thing on Facebook that was supposed to last three or four weeks. And now I'm stuck with it. But I did it so that I could, it's on our international Facebook page, Cry of Deliverance, and I did it so that the people in our network around the world could, could feel a little more, um, they could hear from us personally as we went through this COVID and um, last week I mentioned that I had been thinking about this song it started on Thursday I think and it was a group that I had never even seen live but Sister Pam had and I believe she brought me a cassette tape come on gang we're going back now not eight track that's you some of you guys but cassette, that's us. <laughs> and then CD, and then, and then flash drive. <laughs> we got the generations here. And, uh, that, and I told you, or I don't know if I mentioned it Sunday, but the name of the group, they were, they were considered, uh, and I guess you would say the genre was Southern Gospel. That was where they won their awards, but they were not. Uh, Sister Pam will tell you that they were rockabilly, and that's, that's how I always consider them anyways. She brought me that cassette, and I got to thinking about the song. The name of the group is the Magruders. And if you've never heard them, you can find her, Priscilla Magruder, online. You'll see some recordings on YouTube, but nothing. She died in 2010 at the age of 61. Um, nothing is currently available. You can't buy their music anywhere. So I, I, got, I found my cassette. I knew where it was at. I had to go. It was in a box from 1990. And Pastor Pete digitized it for me, so I have it on my computer. But um, if, you, if you're struggling, you're going through dark things, she was healed of breast cancer many years prior and then fought it, I think, two more times and um, eventually passed away in, in 19, uh, or excuse me, 2010. He was an unbelievable songwriter. She was his second wife. They, he and his first wife had two small children, and she was killed in an automobile accident in 1975. 1976, he married Priscilla, and she raised those two kids really as her own. And um, if you, uh, you know, other than Sister Pam, there's nobody out there that I would rather hear than, than them as a group, but her in particular. And there is one video of her in a, a coliseum at a conference of some sort. 
and she sings the song all the way through. She starts really pr- on the platform on her knees praying, and she comes out, and during the song, she walks all the way back to the Colosseum, shaking hands and praying for people as she goes. And then she has them start the music again, and she's up in the second level praying for people. And it is just a sight to behold because she really operated in the power of the Holy Spirit. Just a, a different level. Just, Pam said that she read the, the two kids now are not much younger than us, I guess. But she read that they said of her she was the most praying person they knew. And um, he was the songwriter. His writing is phenomenal, but... You just haven't heard. Name me some secular gravel voice women. Um, that And she's beyond them. Uh, I'm thinking of Blondie. Bonnie Raitt. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? The, the gravel voice and can push it like they're going to lift the roof off? Yeah, this, this lady was that times ten. And... Um, most people today have never, never heard of her, but she, she brought the power and presence of God. That's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Um, I, I'm realizing something that I, I'd never seen before. And everything we've done here in the last few weeks, I'm going to do in Pakistan. We're doing a pastor's conference there. And among other things, I've been working on travel arrangements. Yesterday, I did, I did a video conference with Pakistan and they're either nine or ten hours ahead of us. And so at like 11 or, no, it was one, whatever time it was here, it was 10.30 at night there. And they were still in the studio working on the events we're going to do there next month. And he was showing me, he had three guys in there working on posters and all of that. So in those events, one of the things that Dr. Paul I and I are going to do is a uh, big pastor's conference. And everything that you and I have just done is going to be my study for the pastor's conference. Because I'm convinced that we need to prepare to move in to what the Holy Spirit's doing right now in these end times. And um, then later in the day, I was on a video conference, and I had Pastor Salvador's in New Mexico right now so that he can get here to go with me to Pakistan. He was on the call. I was on the call. He was on the call a missionary in El Salvador, and, a, and two pastors in Bogota, Colombia. That's cool. Now, it was tough because Salvador was having to translate everybody, translating me to them and them to me. But uh, that was my day. In between, I was buying uh, $12,000 worth of airline tickets. <laughs> I only messed up once. <laughs> I had to cancel the whole order and start over. And right now I'm very, just being very focused on what's happening in Pakistan, what we're going to do there next month. The one night, we're only going to do one night in Karachi as of right now, and they expect us to be well over 30,000 people there. And we get one shot at that. And I'll tell you, you know, having done this for a lot of years now, you just, you realize that that one shot is so critical. And now, because of, you know, everybody having a phone and, and recording everything, it's just unreal um, what, what you go through, thinking through all those things. The Holy Spirit does something in the Bible that culminates, I believe, in Acts chapter 11. And we're going to look at this second. We did the first half last week. We talked about Acts 1 and verse 4. Why don't you go back there tonight? And let's just remind ourselves of what it is that we're we're seeing, okay? And you have the opportunity, please, to make comments, ask questions. Thanks for being here. I uh, I left a meeting today, and and my radio was on, or I kicked it on. It was on WCBC, and it was the. Um, the Rush Limbaugh show. I had just been texted by Pam and Kyle that he had passed away. And I don't know what it was on the radio, but it was obviously a pre-recorded him. And he was, it, it, it was from the last few months, I guess. But he was playing clips from 30 years ago. And he was in California. He was thanking the audience uh, where he had started 
for helping him, really for making him everything he was. It was a, a really incredible, heartfelt thank you. He did a great job of explaining what I often try to express. I can't do what I do without you doing what you do. And when you fight with the kids and you debate whether to even get out of the house and come, why not just wait and watch it on Facebook? Or, you know, why should I go? It's going to snow after midnight. Listen, I know. When I was a kid and we'd all try and get, get to church, and we were three kids, me and my two little sisters, and, and our life had just really changed a lot, and um, it was usually a zoo on the way to church. Sometimes it was a zoo in church, too. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you that you do that. You know, it just it means everything. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Once when he was eating with them, don't you love that? And we serve a God that loves to eat and fellowship with us. He commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, there is no way theologically, if you have two doctorates in theology, or if you're like all of us, and you're just trying to read the Bible. There's no way from either side of that great spectrum of Bible theology intellect that you can deny the simplicity of this. God has a promise, and that promise is the Holy Spirit. That's critical. These are the last words of Jesus, and this is what he wants to know about. And then verse 7, he replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, so now let's go to Acts chapter 8. Let's keep that in mind. Okay, Acts chapter 8. And we're going to look at verse 18 first. When Simon saw... The Holy Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people. He offered them money to buy this power. Now, we don't want to get too caught up in Simon because what he does is not scriptural. And Peter rebukes him. You and your money perish. You, your heart's not right. That, but look at, look at what it says about what happened. When Simon saw, we often allow people who are not in spirit-filled or Pentecostal charismatic churches to point to us and say, well, it's all of that tongues and it's all of that emotion and, and it's all about that sound. But Simon saw something. It doesn't say when he heard it says when he saw. Now, that's a small distinction, but I just want to make note of that. And so what was it that he saw? Well, we go back up to verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem, isn't it interesting that we're reading a lot about Jerusalem tonight? When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. And Peter and John go, really, because they are not absolutely convinced, in my opinion, that the Samaritans have really accepted Jesus Christ. Now, you know when he was doing the ministry, when Jesus was here, he went through Samaria and he had a powerful impact. But that was him and this is them. And I'm not convinced, they're convinced, that Samaria is really having a breakout of, of revival. And so they send Peter and John and say, listen, get up there and straighten this mess out and get all of our Jewish people out of there. You know those Samaritans, you can't trust them. Let's get out of there. And so Peter and John go traipsing up to Samaria. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. Because if you love Jesus, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit in, in the book of Acts. And if you don't, it's because you're really not saved. Now, I know I'm putting a little twist and a spin on this, right? But this has to be in the back of their mind. I know Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But listen, gang, 
they had left Jerusalem, they're not thinking about, the, they couldn't care less about the uttermost parts of the earth, and they're definitely not going to Samaria. But here they are. Because somebody's called back to headquarters and said, they're getting saved. Peter and John run up there and say, oh, uh-huh, you're saved, huh? We'll find out. And the Bible says they laid their hands on them. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, listen, you can, you can confess Jesus and you can get water baptized, but Peter and John laid their hands on them. And guess what? They received the Holy Spirit. Now, you and I can say, oh, hey, that's terrific. Great. <laughs> But back at headquarters, this is not what they're expecting. This is not the way this is going to play out. This is the promise of God. All the promises come to which people? Who? Who do the promises come to? Paul said, what benefit is there in being a Jew? Much in every way because they have the oracles of God. They have all of the promises. Not the Gentiles. Gentiles don't have the promises. No promises for the Gentiles. Oh, there's a few there in the Old Testament scattered around. But we haven't seen any of them come to fulfillment. We're not paying attention to them. We are the children of Abraham. We have the blessing. All the earth gets blessed because of us, and we get the blessing of all the earth. Everything belongs to us. We're the Jewish people. We're the precious ones of God. Na 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 na. you're not. Now listen, you can say, Pastor, that's, that's not the way it was. That's the way it is right now. But something's happening over in Samaria. And, and there's no denying it. Peter and John go, not just, you know, Billy Bob, who's been one of the 500 or 120 or 70. or No, no, no. This is Peter and John, gang. These are, these are the pillars of the pillars. And so they go running up to Samaria and say, listen, we've heard stories that you're confessing Jesus. Even We've even heard you about getting water baptized. But you're not Jewish people. We lay our hands on you. You're going to drop dead. That's why we brought Peter along, because he does that kind of stuff. He he doesn't even have to lay hands on you. He just says it and you drop dead. And then before they can even get you carried out and buried, you, the next one will drop dead. And that's why he's here. You better repent now because you're going to drop dead. And they lay their hands on him. And lo and behold, bam. Now this is important because something theological takes place. So let's go over to the meeting now back home at headquarters and figure out what's happening. Chapter 9. And look at verse 17. In the middle of all of this, Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Hmm. Why wouldn't he say so that you can get saved? Because obviously Saul has already confessed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is what we call an interlude. The issue with Peter and John and the Samaritans has not yet been completely dealt with in the book of Acts. But we have this interlude in which the future apostle is transformed. And now look at verse 28. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Now that's what Jesus had promised. You'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses. So Ananias says, Saul, I'm going to pray for you and you're going to be healed or delivered, those scales are going to fall off, and you're going to have an experience with the Holy Spirit. Now Luke doesn't record for us what that experience looked like. I'm using that word because that's the word that Simon used, or the Bible says of Simon, when he saw. We don't know what it looked like because Luke doesn't record it for us. I don't think he feels any need to record it 
because he's recording it so many other places. Okay, hang with me. Now look at verse 31. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. If we are going to see deliverance from our problems in our nation and around the world, it's going to take an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I was told yesterday that the influx right now of crystal meth into our community is making heroin and fentanyl look like candy. The, the intensity of it and the problems and the repercussions that are coming just flooding the place. Listen, gang, I'm not in that world, so when I hear it, you know it's, it's, it's out there everywhere. And, you know, we're at a point where we're just so all so overwhelmed and almost hopeless because of this drug issue and our kids are being stolen from us. Look what happens. I've got there in your notes. So when they see the Holy Spirit, when, when the Holy Spirit is observed, when he's present, when he's working, here are the things that we should see. Being filled, being with the apostles, and being encouraged. These are the kinds of things that we should see. When the Holy Spirit comes, there, there's this move of people being spirit-filled, and it's observable. There's evidence of it. You can see it. There's something there that you can see. And when the Holy Spirit is moving, there's a sense that, that people are with the apostles. I'm picking that out of verse 28. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly. Well, Pastor, we don't have apostles today. We do. And more and more, we're seeing evidence that God is identifying them. Dr. Paul I, if there is anybody functioning, and I'm not talking about the original 12. Paul wasn't even in the original 12. Barnabas, Apollos, not in the original 12, but pretty important, right? Amen. Okay. So now go to Acts chapter 10. And look at verses 44 through 46. So now Peter has been with Cornelius, so we went from the Samaritans... Now we go to the Gentiles, and the same crazy stuff happens there. In verse 44, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers, the Jewish believers who came with Peter, were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. Ah, oh, oh, there it is. So they had the Samaritans. You know the Samaritans are half Jewish and half Gentile, in, you know, like 30 generations back from what we read about. But that's what they're considered. They're considered to be a Jewish mixture. But they are somewhat Jewish. But the Gentiles are none Jewish, none at all. And so Peter is sent out to straighten all this mess out. And the further he goes, the more God is just doing the impossible. And the Samaritans are all praying in the Spirit and being filled, running around, just having a good time in the Lord. And before he can even get back and report everything, now he, he's, he's just preaching, just trying to mind his own business, figure, okay, if I, ha if I get the chance to preach to the Gentiles, I'll preach and see what happens. And, and he's not even necessarily going to give them a chance to get saved, certainly not. Ask them if they want to receive the Holy Spirit. But while he was saying it, before he could even say, Amen, let's go home, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed, you could say astonished, that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, Can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? Just as we did. Peter, who was there in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, now 
several years later, is saying amongst the Gentiles to the other Jews, well, I don't know now how to put this car in reverse. So I guess our only choice is to baptize him. Um, does anybody object? And I think he's believing maybe he'll get some support here. Oh, well, yeah, we can't baptize Gentiles. Are you nuts? They're going to kick us out before we even get back to Jerusalem. They're going to have our papers and say that we're not even welcome. Nobody says a word. What can we do? So they water baptize him, right? Wouldn't you assume? Mm -hmm. He gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterwards, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. Okay, so this whole idea of it being the same thing. We heard, we saw the same thing. Now go to chapter 11 and look at verse 15. The headline uh, at the top of my chapter is, Peter explains his actions. Well, let's read verse 1 just for the fun of it. Soon the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea that the Gentiles had received the word of God. But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the, Jew the Jewish believers did what? I'm reading from the New Living, but you should say something. Oh, he criticized him. Ah. <laughs> he criticized him. Well, huh? surprise. So you thought I was making all this up. He gets back, and they, he hasn't even come through the gates of the city. And they've already heard. You talk about texting. This was, be, this was supernatural texting, man. They were sending smoke signals. And instantly they hear, and they're just waiting, sitting there. And every hour they wait for Peter to get back, they're stewing even more. Boy, when he comes through, they've got a full head of steam. And they are criticized. Peter! This is the only person we know that walked on water besides Jesus. Whenever the Holy Spirit is falling on people, it makes church and religion uncomfortable. Church will be more critical of the Holy Spirit moving than unbelievers will be. Every time. Every time. So we have to be very, very careful that we understand what's happening and how it's happening and what God is intending to do through it. Let's go down now to what I want to grab in verse um, 15. So Peter's making his defense. As I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as he fell on us at the beginning. Then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. No matter what you and I are facing, if you can think of the word of Jesus, if you can feel an unction for his word, the Holy Spirit brings a promise to you, something to your remembrance, and suddenly you think, that's what Jesus meant when he said that. I'm telling you something. When you've got the Lord's word on it, it's all going to work out okay. Peter's giving his defense. They've criticized him. They're ready to throw him out, tell him he's no good, good for nothing. Give up. You're not worth anything. God doesn't even like you. Get out of here. But he told them, listen, I thought of the Lord's words. When he said, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us. Now notice the emphasis on gift. Since God gave these Gentiles. The same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I to stand in God's way? That's why he was sent to stop this stuff. This is the promise. It belongs to Jewish people. This is the great promise we've been waiting for for eons. We've, we've just been hearing the promise and the repeating of the promise. And now we've, we've got the promise in possession and boom, we can't contain it. And it spreads out beyond the Jewish people. And the Jewish people, the leaders of the Jewish people, just like they had been a few years prior, are mad about it spreading out and going beyond their traditions. Peter says, wait a minute, I know you sent me out with that purpose, but who was I to do that? Now, this is cool. Verse 18, when the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. There you go. That's the turning point of the word of God. 
Now it all turns on this phrase, the gift, the gift. There are so many things we could talk about that God's gift, we, we, we really do talk about eternal life as the gift in the church. And I understand that, okay? I'm not disagreeing. But I want you to understand that eternal life is given so that you can receive the gift. That, that one's, you have to get saved so you can get the gift. But that's not the end of the gift. Getting saved, finding Jesus, that's just so you're dressed up, so you get the right clothes on to get the gift. That's not the promise. That's not the gift. There's something so much more. But pastor, you're, you're denigrating the Lord Jesus. No, he said it himself. Listen, I, I want to send the promise of my Father upon you. I'll do it. You don't have to think you're making light of my ability to save you or that you're not uh, being thankful enough for that. I just want to send the gift to the Father. I saved you so that I could give you the gift. All right. Well, you're almost kind of with me. Go to Joel. Let's go to Joel because this is where it's at. It's in the Old Testament, that little book of Joel. Now, interestingly... If you look in the introduction to Joel, in the New Living, these New Living Bibles, it says that his prophecy takes place between, they think, and and they're usually uh, pretty conservative, but between 835 and 796. And I tell you that because you need to understand when this happens. This is before the Jewish nation is taken into captivity. For example, I just flipped to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, it says chapters 1 through 39, probably written 700 B.C. Chapters 40 to 66, uh, near the end of Isaiah's life, around 681, so roughly 20 years uh, later comes that. Joel is written 100 years before Isaiah. So I want you to think about the Old Testament. I want you to think about primarily the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and then the beginning of the New Testament. And that thousand-year span, Joel is way back not too long after David's time. All right? So this is him prophesying before Israel goes into judgment. Listen to what he says in chapter 3. Ready? 328. Oh, I kept my finger in Isaiah, not Joel. Oh, why would I do that? Don't you hate when that happens? 328. Oh, I got the wrong reference, don't I? Did I mean 228? Yeah, 228. Sorry. Are you there? 2 and 28. Then, after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. That, my friend, is the promise. That's the promise of God. I will pour out my spirit. Now, for a lot of years in churches like ours and Pentecostal churches, we've we've taken this and said that because the Holy Spirit is being poured out, then that's a sign of the soon return of Jesus Christ. And I understand that. I'm not arguing with that. But I want you to look very closely here at what he says. He says he's going to pour out his spirit on all people. Now, I don't know how he pours his spirit out on lost people. As a matter of fact, the New Testament paints a picture that that is not possible. Yes, the the spirit can do something, but he can't fill the vessel. You have to be saved. Jesus has to be residing. You have to have the blood, redemption, forgiveness, reconciliation. You have to have all of that before the Holy Spirit can be what he is tended, intended to be in your life, filling you and flowing through you, right? We, we understand that. And so what does this mean? I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Well, <clears throat> obviously he shifts gears then and says you, your, your sons and your daughters. That's why the Jewish people felt this was just for them. This is our gift. We're not sharing it with anybody else. This is ours. And that's really in the book of Acts. They're struggling with that. They don't want anybody else to have it. 
They know the value of this. They know the value. You, you want to find out value of something. Now, I'm going to be a little bit, um, what would you say here, not politically correct. But my Jewish friends will tell you, you want to know the value of something, they'll know the value. And they recognized the value of this and felt that it was so important that they keep it exclusive because it was the evidence of all that God wanted to do. It was his promise. Oh, there are other ones back there. You can find them. But this is the one that he promises and builds every other promise around. I'm going to pour out my spirit on everybody. I'm going to pour it out. Now, here's my take on this. This is just me. I might be wrong. I'm not speaking like I don't feel God giving me this. Or it's not a prophecy. But just what I've been playing around with, there are going to be a lot less unbelievers when Jesus returns. They're not going to be the majority. As a matter of fact, they might be a minority that's so small you can't even see them. If he's going to pour his spirit out on everybody, and you have to be a Jesus lover for that to happen, then that tells me, and this makes sense to my little brain, that when Jesus is getting ready to come back, he's got just about everybody, if not everybody, on his side. Now, listen, I'm not saying, I know there's 8 billion people on the earth. I'm not saying 8 billion people are going to get saved. I'm just telling you that we are entered into, not going to, we are entered into the midst of this promise because this is everything God has been talking about. The picture back when the, the servant of Abraham went to find a bride for Isaac, he takes all of the treasure, and the Bible says he gives gifts to her mom, dad, brother, but then he, he looks at her and says, now you come here. He gave that one a gift and that one a gift and that one a gift. But to her, he says, oh, no, not a gift, not a gift. We're redressing you from head to toe. We're putting on jewelry, every arm, uh, eyes, nose, rings, every, ankles, toes. You you're going to be everything that I can cram on your body. We're putting it on there. It's diamonds and, and gold and it's silver and platinum and it's rubies and emeralds. And listen, when, when you're done, honey, there's, there is no way to measure what you're worth. And the Jewish people, even though they were believers in Jerusalem, they got it. And they knew it. And they said, this is it. This is the promise. It cannot escape. They'll ruin it. The Gentiles will ruin it. They'll just trample it in the mud. They don't know the value. They don't even care about the value. Look at them. You give them a beach and they build a skyscraper. Don't, don't give it to them. Just keep it here. We'll protect it. We love the things of God. They don't know about the things of God. Don't let them have it. Bam. It breaks out on every side. The Samaritans are praising God, shouting, praying in tongues. Peter leaves there and says, well, I didn't, I didn't succeed. I just won't tell him. And on the way back, he's over with the Gentiles, not just the Gentiles, and says, well, listen, I'll preach a little bit if you'll pay me. I'll give you a little message here. And while he's preaching, bam, the whole, you know I'm kidding, right? I don't know if he told him he had to pay him or not. But the Holy Spirit fell. God wouldn't even let him close in prayer and get out of town. He let the Holy Spirit fall now we've got a dilemma uh-huh yeah because now the gentiles praying just like the samaritans did and the samaritans prayed just like the apostles did in the upper room with mary the mother of the lord jesus and this is what they know that's it simon says great god in heaven i'll give you any amount of money you give me that gift He's been a sorcerer. He's like Dr. Paul. He knows 6,366 gods of Hindu. But now, now he sees. He sees the gift. And he says, I'll give you anything to be able to give that to people. That, my friend, is what's coming. That's what's coming. I, don't, I, I know there's all these concerns about this, that, and the other politics and pandemics and, and the, the wind turbines freezing in Texas. None of that matters. I know it hurts, and it's, but listen. 
This is his promise. Jesus said, I'm going to send the promise. That's who I'm going to send. It's the promise of my father. Did he promise redemption to Adam and Eve? Yes, he did. But this is the promise to all people of all generations, of all lands. I uh, just working on things for Pakistan last, next month and just feel the Lord tell me, just preach the Holy Spirit. Just preach the visitation of the Holy Spirit and watch what I do. Because this is the hour. You have a comment or a question. I'm done. Hmm? <laughs> something, I, something has shifted in me, and I know a lot of it is because Sunday I told you I have a 30-day countdown window, and, and I can feel it. But last week when I realized that I'm coming up on a 40-year anniversary of an experience with the Holy Spirit, it, it just it has really changed me, plus my prayer time. I'm hitting now about three good days out of four. And um, that, that's it, it's just been remarkable. Amen. What do we do with it? Well, praise God, we go. Amen. Tell somebody. I, I'm going to preach Sunday to, to lost people. I'm just so sick of not seeing anybody get saved. I, I can't stand it. I just somebody's got to say, I don't want any of this world. I don't want the drugs. I don't want sex. I don't want uh, same gender, cross gender, transgender. I just want Jesus. Yeah, what? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, God doesn't do something in us that, is, that we recognize every day. He doesn't speak to us. I, this is me. You may feel differently. But the Lord doesn't speak to me all the time. And it's, it's a very precious thing when I feel like he does, just like you. It's not audible, but when I feel like God has really nudged me, that's, um, even that is rare. And so it's a great, great thing. And I've been asking the Lord that a lot lately, the last couple of months. Why? Why am I praying, you know, and I walk when I pray, and, you know, it's tough now. It's really, it just hurts me um, physically at times. And I said, Lord, maybe I'm wasting my time. And I don't, I'm not an intercessor. You, you may be disappointed by that, but I don't pray for you very much. When Pam and I are together and we pray in the mornings, uh, we have a short devotion and pray, and, and I pray for the church then. And occasionally I'll pray, like when I loop the church here, I'll pray. But primarily, I'm, I'm worshiping. That's all I do is just, just the name of Jesus. And um, I haven't heard any answer to my question. But I never quit. I never lose that feeling of come deeper. Come deeper. Brother Bill? Yeah, I, I don't know how you uh, verbalize the Trinity. I, I don't know what language you use. I, I, I think as humans, we're so limited. It's really about how we express, but God the Father, the way it's revealed to us in the Word is so that we can process it. Uh, God's not confused about his existence, but it's very difficult for us. So God the Father, obviously, and the Son... 
but the Holy Spirit seems to be the agency or the, the, the work of God. And do I believe he is a person? He's certainly described with personable characteristics and features in the Word of God, but you don't see him uh, very often as the object of worship. You don't see him as the object. You see Jesus as the object. Or as Jesus said, pray to the Father and pray in my name, and he'll do what you ask for. But that's it. You know, as we interact with the Lord, the Holy Spirit enables us, empowers us, energizes us to do the Father's work. Somebody else tonight? Question or comment? How you see it? Joel chapter 2? Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Yeah, but even so, why why is it, excuse me, why is it that we see some historically we see some visitations of God and, and you don't get the sense that people did anything to make the visitation happen. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know each of you, your daily life, but I I get a pretty good sense. And I've got a church of people who, by and large, really want to see, like me, want to see God do something. They really, my church is desperate to see God change our community and our country, right? And so why, it seems like we pray more than, than they, all of them did in Acts 10 and 11 put together. And part of this, you may not like my answer, but part of it is timing. You know, we can't make it happen, but we can continue to expect it to happen. Okay? When you look at great moves in the uh, American history, uh, we have the First Great Awakening, which more or less coincided with the Revolutionary War, and the Second Great Awakening, which more or less coincided with the Civil War. The great preacher revivalist Charles Finney, uh, during this just just up to uh, and in the big buildup of the Civil War, he would preach and and say two words, and people would fall and be born again. And if you read his biography, his autobiography, he attributes all that to an encounter he had with the Holy Spirit. And I I get it, but uh, some of it was timing as well, God's timing. Yeah, I do, Sister Linda. I think hunger is a big part of it, absolutely. And, and I think I really do see a lot of evidence in America. When, when you look at, and I haven't studied it in depth, but a, a little bit, both the First and Second Great Awakening, there was a season. It's easy to look back and read one paragraph in a history book or in the Bible. It covers 40 years. And say, well, you know, why isn't that happening now? But during that 40 years, God was using his people to prepare. And I think that's happening now. I think prayer meetings here, there, and everywhere are springing up. I think, <clears throat> I think there's coming among the young adults an anger at the culture. I'm going to tell you, we've seen this before. And when it happens, it's going to upset us. Because when they start throwing stuff out, they'll throw everything out that's not nailed down, and they'll pry up a lot of what is nailed down, throw it out too. But they're going to throw out social media. They're going to throw out all of the cultural conflicts. They're going to throw out politics. And again... I'm not saying they're going to be right, but I'm telling you when it starts, they're going, to be, they're going to demonstrate an anger at what's happened to a level at which I don't think this nation has ever seen it. And they're going to be so angry at drugs and addiction and how everything has failed them and let them and their friends 
die. And I, I'm not sure about this, but this is what I feel is coming. That there's going to be a cry among them. One of them is going to be uh, launched as a voice for this generation. It's not going to be a rock star or a social influencer. I'm praying that it is a fire-filled preacher. But somebody's going to get their attention and they are going to burn the place down. I don't mean it in a political sense. Like I'm just talking about them looking for answers. And um, we, we've got to be ready. The Jesus movement, remember in the late 60s, early 70s, and the kids came into the church and they were there with no shoes on and long hair. Oh, for the days of just long hair, you know. They didn't know you could get tattoos all over your body. They didn't know you could get, get holes in your ear besides the one God gave you, right? They, they didn't know you could have them big loops and could see right through your head. Boy, those were the days. And the church, whoo! Somebody else tonight. The Holy Spirit. That's exactly what happened in the 1960s and 70s when people in Catholic churches and Episcopalian churches, you know, they, Dr. Jim Lindsay, our friend, many of you know him and a good friend of many of the churches here in town, he was just telling me a few months ago, you know, he got saved in a, an Episcopalian church in California in the uh, 1970s, I believe it was. And um, that church was having revival. Half of the people generally half of them had an experience with the Holy Spirit and were praying in languages that they had not learned or been taught. The other half, while not having had the experience, was supportive. And so he came into that as a young adult, I think he was 30 or 32, married, a couple of kids, and radically saved, but no idea how to deal with any of that. And he just tells some really funny stories, and some of them painful as well, about how difficult all of that was. So for us tonight, I want us to leave with this understanding that the apostles did an amazing thing here at the end of chapter 11. They listened. They parked all of their expectations, and all of their hopes of being a Jew and all of their training and their preparation and hopes for the future, they parked it all. And when Peter said, listen, i got to remind you what Jesus taught us. This is exactly what he said was going to happen. The Bible says they, they just stopped and said, well, well, then praise God. This is it. Now Paul gets this. Paul sees all this. He's right in the thick of it. And so years later he writes, this is the mystery. This is in Ephesians. This is the mystery that the eternal wall that had been there between Jew and Gentile has been torn down. And you, you can come in too. When you read Ephesians, you watch how many times he says that. This is the mystery that God showed me. I have been given the understanding of the mystery. The mystery how can the Gentiles get this? It's not available. The gift is not for you. The gift is from God to his people. It was his promise. He promised it all along. And we're the people of God. And Paul's looking back at this saying, the mystery is that Jesus Christ tore the wall down and said to the Gentiles, you too. You too. Come on, let's um, close in prayer tonight and let's just spend a few minutes allowing the promise of God to percolate in us and the Holy Spirit to, to stir in us and just to encourage us, but also to remind us of the promise. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you tonight that you did not forget us. You did not overlook us. 
And on that night 40 years ago when I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, it was a Jewish man (laughs) that laid his hands on me. And that Jewish man, knowing the promise, made sure that this Gentile teenager got to come in too. What's your story tonight? Do you understand that when you had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, it was God saying, see, I keep my promises. That was the Father saying to you, I am a promise keeper. This is my promise, and I give it as a gift. It's free. My Son gave everything so that you can receive the gift He's worthy of you having the gift. He's worthy. Forget you and your worthiness. He's worthy for you to be dressed up. This is the robe of fine righteousness. These are the jewels and and emeralds and rubies, diamonds, gold and silver. This is you being decked from the very top hair of your head to the very bottom of your foot with the glory and beauty of my God presence and my son is worthy of it my son is worthy of you having this gift because the gift is for you to know him to be presented to him to worship him to interact with him Jesus come tonight upon us with power and freshness that we might glorify you as we never have before praise the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Glory to God. Yes, Lord. Now listen, church, again, I want you to be able to go home, and I want you to take time, maybe even tonight, once everybody else is in bed, if, if you've got kids, it can be just you by yourself or you and your spouse, but I want you to, to get somewhere in the next 24 hours, if possible, where you can take five or seven minutes with the Lord and just say, Jesus, I want to know that gift. I want to see the value like Simon saw the value. I know I can't buy it. And I don't want to see it in somebody else. I want to see it in me. Now, Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters tonight. They're hungry, Lord. They're hungry. We're hungry for that time in which something changes in our churches so that it can change in our nation. We worship you tonight. I thank you for every brother and sister of mine. Lord, they are so committed to being in this house and committed to seeing you get glory and seeing you reach people. May you do it among us. And we'll give you the thanks for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. I love you tonight. Love you in the Lord. Have a beautiful night. If you've got kids in the back, please go pick them up, okay? I know it might snow tomorrow and there won't be school, but you've got to take them home anyways.